without further ado, let's, uh, let's bring y'all up. Thank you. Good evening. How are we doing with the sound? Are we good? Yeah. yeah. This space is amazing, and I am so excited to be here. I'm especially excited about these giant monitors showing all of the artwork nice and large across the space tonight. So I am here to talk about finding your must. But before I get into that, I want to kick things off with a very big thank you, thank you, thank you across all three screens. The first is to Michelle Morrison. Michelle, who I actually just had the pleasure of meeting tonight, um, I feel like has been this wonderful source of encouragement and support of my work happening mainly through social media throughout the last year. Thank you, Michelle, wherever you are. And she connected me with um, the team here, which got this whole ball rolling. So thank you. And Joe, you are amazing. Thank you for what you do. Um, this is three years now, not just in San Francisco, but also in LA and in New York. And I think this is absolutely incredible. Can we just get a round of applause for the... <laughs> so, like any awesome talk, I'm going to start off with a big old disclaimer. I call this the giant elephant in the room. This is the, the big scary secret that I would like to just go ahead and share with you. I have absolutely no idea if tonight's talk is going to work. Um, the thinking behind this is that I might not tell you what you came here to learn. I might not talk about my professional experience enough if you want to hear about mailbox and Uber. This probably isn't the talk. Um, I might not talk enough about design, and it might not tell you uh, what you really wanted to come and hear. And frankly, it might not speak to you at all. <laughs> On the other end of things, it might totally freak you out and might absolutely overwhelm you or ask too much or send you straight to whiskey after the talk, <laughs> in which case, please bring me with you. So, no matter how you look at it, I've realized that this is the only talk that I can give because this talk is a result of my journey and my life, especially over the last year. And I simply don't have any other talk to share except for this one. So this is what you get. So let's summarize all of this before we even start. So we're all on the same page that I have absolutely no idea, no idea what I'm doing. The talk might not work. By the way, I'm totally unemployed. And you have just spent good money to come here on a beautiful Thursday evening in San Francisco to hear me speak. I am so sorry, Joe. <laughs> whiskey, whiskey. But there is a reason, a really important reason that I'm here and that I have made the decisions that I have and that's what I want to walk you through tonight. So let's go ahead and dive in. I want to start tonight with a story. This is from a book called The Gift. Are you guys familiar with this book? It's amazing. Anyway, I, re I recommend checking it out. I want to read you a passage from this book. Um, it talks about Pablo Neruda. He's a poet. Playing in the lot behind the house one day when he was still a little boy, Pablo Neruda discovered a hole in a fence board. I feel like we're at story time. Let's go to the first slide. I looked through the hole and I saw a landscape like that behind our house, uncared for and wild. I moved back a few steps because I sensed vaguely that something was about to happen. And all of a sudden, a hand appeared. A small hand, a tiny hand of a boy of about my own age. By the time I came close again, the hand was gone and in its place, was a marvelous white toy sheep. I can't draw a sheep, but that's about as good as we're gonna get tonight. <laughs> the sheep's wool was faded like my drawing. Its wheels had escaped, and all of this only made it more authentic. I had never seen such a wonderful sheep. <laughs> wow, I looked back through the hole, but the boy had disappeared. 
I went into the house and I brought out a treasure of my own, a pine cone, opened, full of odor and resin, which I adored. I set it down in the same spot and I went off with the sheep. That exchange brought home to me for the first time a precious idea that all of humanity is somehow together. And this is the great lesson I learned in my childhood in the backyard of a lonely house. Maybe it was nothing but a game that two boys played who didn't know each other and wanted to pass to the other some good things in life. Yet maybe this small and mysterious exchange of gifts remained inside of me also, deep and indestructible, giving my poetry light. That brings us to today. The title of my talk is Find Your Must, but it could also very well be Find Your Sheep, or Find Your Pine Cone, or just quite simply, Find Your Gift. And then, after you found it, give your gift away tirelessly. I have been um, self-employed for about eight months now. I actually saw somebody's jaw drop over there when I said that I was unemployed. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> She's very upset. But um, I've actually been self-employed, which is what we like to call ourselves, for about um, eight months now. And I've learned a few really cool, awesome things about gifts along the way. And I wanted to share them with you. The first is that everyone has a gift. And this gift is unique to you. And I believe that since there is just one you, every single person, there's what, 250 people in this room? There are 250 unique gifts in this room. And because only one of you exists in all of time, forever and ever and always, that one gift has its one shot to get out into the world through you. Isn't that amazing? I think that's incredible. So this gift, this beautiful, beautiful gift. Imagine a world if all 250 of us were actually operating from that place and we were giving these, these most true, highest expressions of ourselves as human beings while we're here on Earth. Imagine that. If just this room of 250 people were to do it. I think that's so beautiful. I think it's so beautiful. But the second insight is this, and this is a sad insight. Many people are really disconnected from their gifts. But the good news is that your gifts never go away. You have them forever. They're like, they're like stamped in there, like a blueprint inside of you. And while you can feel far from your gift, you can never lose it. And you can always reconnect to it. I find this very reassuring. It is with you forever. And the final insight that I've learned around gifts over the last eight months is that when you give your gift, oh, this is the best part, it actually benefits so many other people besides just yourself. Because let's say this is you with the, with the triangle gift. I believe that there are people all around the world who have these empty shapes inside of them just waiting to be filled up with exactly what you have to offer. I think that's incredible. Find your gift. Give your gift. That's the talk. Well, first we had a TED talk. About a year ago, I came across Stefan Stagmeister's uh, TED Talk about jobs and careers and callings. Specifically, here we are. And I thought this talk was really interesting because he basically described that these three things are different. And what I began to do, and what I challenge you to do right now, is to identify which of these you have right now. You might have a job during the day and then pursue a calling on nights and weekends. or you might be dedicated to finding your calling full time and burning through all of your savings and making no money. And that's okay too. But I think it's really important to be aware of where you are. Because it would be a tragedy if we mistook our jobs for our callings, as that is not often the case. So about a year ago, I began to ask this question. I've had like the most unbelievable, such fortunate chance to work with these amazing teams. 
I can't even believe it, from Mailbox to IDEO to Uber to Medium and so many other startups, some of which might even be here um, tonight, to work with these incredible teams. And I began to ask this question, where in all of this work that I was doing, and you can do this with your, I almost want to say like LinkedIn profile, you can look at that, you know, your whole spectrum, your whole resume in one slide and ask the question, where, what's, what's a job? Where's the career? Where's the calling? How is that laid over all of this? It's really fascinating. And at the same time, about a year ago, I picked up a book by Arianna Huffington. Uh, it was Picasso. It was his biography. And in it, there is a quote that I want to share with you. This quote totally floored me. Whoops. Like the mic. <laughs> yes. Ariana Huffington, in talking about Picasso, she said, the more I discovered about Picasso's life and the more I delved into his art, the more the two converged. It's not what an artist does that counts, but who he is, Picasso said. But his art was so thoroughly autobiographical that what he did was what he was. This led me to a giant hypothesis. What if our jobs were our careers, were our callings? How great is that across all three slides? Yes, I love it. This is a huge insight for me. And around this time, it was February 2013. And what was happening in 2013, in this, this month? Mailbox was launching. Mailbox. I, I feel when I talk about Mailbox, like it's, it's like you're a football player and you're in college and you get drafted into the NFL and you join the team that wins the Super Bowl in your very first year. Like, it was such a life highlight to go from an idea on a post-it note to something that's out in the world and to have the type of um, um, reception that it had, to have all of our goals so wonderfully exceeded. Um, it felt not too dissimilar from climbing to the first of, of many um, peaks on Mailbox's journey. And at that time, I began to wonder about this idea of a job and a career and a calling. And this was tricky because Mailbox was doing awesome. Mailbox was, you know, in tons of acquisition talks. Mailbox was, things were going really well. But I found myself, as I sat at my computer with, you know, every you know, metric going off the charts inside of our Palo Alto office and our team just floored about what was happening, I, I found myself beginning to wonder, was I in my job, was I in my career, or was I in my calling? And I realized that designing email, although audacious and amazing, wasn't my life's work. And I think this is the tricky thing about callings, is that they ask for just different things. And it doesn't mean that you need a, your job and your calling to be the same thing, but it does mean you need to be aware. And I wanted to know what was my calling. And as I stood on this wonderful peak with the Mailbox team, I felt like I was looking off in the distance wondering, what is my own personal, private Mount Everest that I was put on this earth to climb? And I think that's true for all of us. 250 personal, private Mount Everest in this room, and I wanted to find mine. So I called my mom. I said, Mom, I'm leaving my dream job. What? I have nothing lined up. Don't worry. <laughs> I was thrilled. I was very excited about my big journey ahead. I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do, and I began promptly to freak out. After freaking out, whiskey, um, I got my, my wits together and I realized that as designers, we are so capable and equipped to deal with this type of ambiguity, right? We can design our way out of any solution or any problem in the world. So what was I gonna do? I was gonna go back to the IDEO process. I was going to design my life. Well, we start here, we go into a divergent set of solutions, we iterate, 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 we then begin to refine, 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 and we end up at the final optimal disruptive solution. Actually, this, this totally works. It works for everything. Design, you can design anything. So 
I started looking into this and I thought, well, I, ca I can't be the only one who's done something like this. And of course, I'm not. I'm this, all the things I'm talking about, nothing of this is new. In fact, this journey has really deep roots. They go back as far as the walkabout, right? In Aboriginal tribes, you go for a one-year walk across the country for deep personal insights. The vision quest, right? You go into uh, darkness. You deprive yourself of sleep or of light. Maybe take some drugs. You see incredible things. You learn new insights, and you come back to your village, and you share those. Even things in the more traditional sense of a pilgrimage, like the walk across the northern coast of Spain, the Santiago de Compostela. You start on the eastern shore, and you walk all the way to the water. And there at the end, what greets you? but a baptism. How beautiful. What a journey. It turns out tales and myths have been written, written about this exact same thing. Well, not really like Elle's departure from mailbox, but you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, you've got things like the Odyssey, these epic journeys. You've got things like um, you know, this, this hero that's stuck in the belly of the whale over and over and over again. No matter what the tale, no matter what the myth, and no matter what the process diagram, I had one goal. Find my gift. I wanted to find that thing. I just became totally excited about finding that thing that was my job, my career, and my calling. It was all one and the same. So how do you find your calling? I'm going to do something totally audacious, and I'm going to try to deconstruct the design process of finding your calling in four easy steps. <laughs> the first is my favorite because it is so much fun. I like to call this the call to adventure. I think this is a lot better than like the problem statement or whatever we might come up with in our design briefs. So I want to start by telling you a story, a story about the white room. This is a personal story. I guess about um, a year ago, I started having a recurring dream. And in this dream, I could see concrete floors and a white room, and there was nothing in it. But it was this beautiful, luminescent room. And I would dream about it over and over and over again. And finally, a dear friend had the keen insight to say to me, what if, imagine, you tried to find this room in real life. And I thought, well, that's crazy. It's just, I don't even know what I'm looking for. What is this space? And so I set off on the internet, Craigslist, Google. I, I really had no idea what I was looking for. Was I looking for a painting of a white room? Was I looking for a space to stand in? Was I just looking for like some abandoned wing of a museum? I, I had no idea. So I started Googling like a crazy person. And lo and behold, I found this room. I found it on Craigslist. And I remember signing the check at this opening for the deposit that you don't even know if you're going to get the space. I remember signing it and, and just feeling a little nuts. It felt a little absurd. So I had a dream, and I went out and got a space. Right? That's a little bonkers. This was me on the very first night in my dream room that I had been craving, longing for, burning for, dreaming of. And as I sat on the floor with my little dog, Tilly, and looked around at my white walls and my concrete floor, just like in my dream, all I could think was, what in God's name have I done? And as clear as day, in a way that I can't even describe, I felt like all at once, the white wall said back to me, it's time to paint. It sounds so crazy, so crazy, but I'm telling you. So the next day, I bought some art supplies at Blick. I got some tempera paint, I got some um, charcoals and spray paint, because spray paint is awesome. And I, I just went nuts at Blick, and I got a ton of things and just a few small canvases <laughs> to get started. So I went home, I got to work, and I started 
what I believe is the hardest job I have ever had in my life. I painted nonstop, literally nonstop, seven days a week for three months. My friends can attest, I disappeared. And eventually, one day, all of the paintings in my space were packed up and they were all moved. They left my studio for something I never could have imagined in a million years while I was at Mailbox, which was just three months prior. I had my first pop-up show, a solo show here in San Francisco, showing over 60 pieces of art that had come out of my studio. And like I said, this was May. I had stepped away from my full-time gig in March, and I had only moved into this, this dream white room space six months prior. So please, take me literally, literally, when I ask you, I think this is like the key to it all. If you write one thing down, write this. What do you burn for? What do you long for? What do you crave? What are you being called to do? I don't think this comes from a LinkedIn recruiting email. I don't think you find it anywhere out in the world, actually. That's the weirdest part about this whole thing. I'm beginning to believe, almost religiously, that your calling is the exact same thing as that little crazy voice in your head that visits you in the shower and that tells you all the crazy little things that it would like to do. Such as, I want to play the piano right now. I want to race fast sports cars. I want to dance naked in the rain. This is this crazy voice inside of your head. And it craves weird things, scary things, mundane things, surprising things. And it, it's not the first time that it's happened. I was reading um, in Vincent Van Gogh's letters to his brother, Theo. He talks about how he's in business, he's in the early part of his career, he was actually um, a businessman. He came from a very prestigious family and that was what Vincent was going to do. Vincent wrote to his brother Theo, I often long for that world of pictures. Moses, yes, the Moses. Moses was called. Who? Me? But I'm Moses. I have a stutter. How could I possibly be called to lead the people? And yet, Moses was called. What do you burn for, long, crave? And if you aren't quite sure, I have a little exercise that I was hoping we could do together tonight, right now. It'll be painless and it'll be fun. It's this thing called the artist state. How many of you have heard of the artist state? Yes, I see a couple of hands. I know people have gone on them. Okay, the artist state. This is a, this is a famous activity. It's incredible by um, a woman named Julia Cameron. And the artist state is a date that you take your inner artist on let's say once a week if you're lucky, but really like once a month. And there are two rules to this artist date. It's a solo journey, and you can do anything your inner artist would like to do. So I would like for everybody to take out a piece of paper and in just maybe like one minute to write down some of the crazy things. Oh yes, I see lots of smiles. Good, you're on the right track. The crazy things in your head that you long to do. So I'll give you an example. I'm not gonna point any fingers or name any names, but there's someone in this room who has an artist date that I know about. I hope that they go on it. They would like to go to the House of Air and jump on the trampolines while blasting their music in their headphones. Go. You got one minute.
Some of my artist states have been drive a Z3 convertible at top speeds, if that helps. We also have swimming in the ocean at night. Does anybody have one that they would like to share? Yeah? Yeah. Tell us. I would like to hike to the hot springs in Santa Cruz. Oh, nice. She would like to hike to the hot springs in Santa Cruz. Anyone else? Yeah. I'm going to drop in and do a yoga teacher training class. Drop in and do a yoga teacher training class. Just one of the classes of the two hours, 100 hours. Just one. Yeah. That's the best part. I love it. Just one. Amazing. Thank you. Yes. I want to learn to ride a motorcycle. She wants to learn to ride a motorcycle. You don't have to explain this stuff to anybody. You're going on your own. It doesn't matter. I love it. These are amazing. If you all do these, will you please let me know? There's something in them. I had, a, I had a dream about a white room. It ended up turning out that I wanted to paint. See how these things kind of add up? Follow them. I think they're like little, little scavenger hunts, and I'm excited to see where they go. There is something delightfully sacrilegious about this first phase, the call to adventure, and it is so much fun. But the question that I have for you is this. If you heard the call, would you listen? And more importantly, if you would, would you do what it was asking you to do? Would you get that motorcycle? Would you find the yoga class? Would you go and buy the paints? Because it, it needs you a little bit. It needs, it needs you to actually go get the paints so that you can start to paint or get the motorcycle so you can learn to ride. I believe that if you take your dreams seriously, if you take these, these cravings seriously, there's a wonderful quote by Joseph Campbell that says, if you follow your bliss, Doors were, will open where there were no doors before, and I believe it is absolutely true. This brings us in to the second phase. And if the first phase was fun, well, the second phase is a little different. It's, it's, it's trying. I like to call this the leap into the unknown. And this isn't a fun leap. This is a stormy leap. This is intense. This is turbulent. This is not like being on vacation in the Caribbean and going cliff diving. Um, this is really just stepping into not knowing. This is um, following that little voice, no matter how crazy, no, no matter how nuts it might seem to be, following it by jumping off a giant cliff. One does not discover new lands without consenting to lose sight of the shore for a very long time. We know this in design. We know this, but it's a little different when you're designing your life, right? How do we do it? Well, again, we can look to design for the answer. We do things like defer judgment or encourage wild ideas. Are you guys getting feedback back there? A little bit. Um, encouraging wild ideas. We look for quantity over quality. We do all these wonderful things that help us surrender into the process, surrender into the journey. And when you're doing this, you're agreeing to let go. You're agreeing to say just, Put me on the roller coaster and I'll go, right? You're committing to this process and it's very unscripted. And you have to make you, yourself do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. I have this friend, her name is April, and April, whenever she gets creative block, she told me this the other day, she gets up from her table, she goes over to her jewelry drawer, and she picks out the biggest, most ridiculous pieces of jewelry. And she puts them on, and then she goes back to her table and she sits down. And that, that works it out. Similarly, my friend Mora has a practice where she leaves stories in the form of collections of books and photos and objects all around her apartment so that, quite literally, she trips over what's important. Where do they come up with this stuff? I don't know. But the point is, do something, anything, and your journey begins. So the question I have is, why don't people make the leap? Doesn't this all seem like so much fun, right? We get to go race motorcycles and go hike to hot springs. People don't make the leap probably because they know what's ahead in phase three. The third phase, I lovingly like to call total failure, absolute humiliation in front of all your friends and family, complete abandonment, and guaranteed death. 
No, no, do not be fooled. Leaping into the unknown is scary, and that is why they call it like the labyrinth or the wilderness or the dark night. I recently had dinner in New York with this amazing guy who um, was at Google for a really long time. He just stepped away to go on this whole roller coaster ride. And I asked him, what was the first thing you did after you left? And this is what he told me. The first thing I did was spend three months learning to be alone again. I got an office and every day I had to go sit in it for five hours. <laughs> I love this. This is amazing. There's no right way to do this. The point is you just have to stick to it. And I have to warn you, it will be easy to go back to the things that you know. It'll be really easy to try to pick up just, you know, kind of a freelance job. It'll be really easy to quickly overbook your week. You've got 40 hours. Whoops, how did that happen? It's really easy to go back to the old way of doing things. Or, as Seth Godin says, my favorite, to go back to the dancing monkey treats. A dancing monkey treat is just a prize. And, um, we're all susceptible to dancing monkey treats. They could be things like your job title. They could be things like a decent paycheck, right? These are the things, um, like when I, when I, I remember when I left a, a whole series of jobs, wondering like what to put in my Twitter bio. And then as I was doing more art, like, I don't know, do I say that I'm an artist on Twitter? Like, oh, it was all so stressful. And I, I I think it's really easy to, to, to go back and like lean on these old methods that you know so well, they worked forever, they work for everybody else, but don't do it. Because ultimately, this moment arrives in your journey, and it always does, and we're so grateful for it when it does. This special point, which I like to call the point of no return. You suddenly get very, very far from shore. You have officially left the mothership. You are very far from everything that you know, and although terrifying, this is exactly where you're meant to be. Snakes go through this process when they shed their skin. And the reason sh snakes shed their skin in the first place is because their bodies are getting bigger. They actually don't fit. They've overgrown their skin. And it's to allow for more growth. How beautiful is that? While molting, snakes tend to hide because they're really vulnerable, right? They're literally exposing this fresh new growth. And I think this is a bit, obviously, what it feels like when you jump off a cliff and follow your calling. It's very vulnerable, it's very scary. In addition to this, I just found this out. As a snake is shedding their skin, and the skin gets up around their head, when they flip their skin over the top of their head, I guess they don't use their hands, however they get it off their head, over their eyes, they actually go temporarily blind. The snake goes temporarily blind as the skin crosses their eyes. I think this is ridiculous. <laughs> hey, universe, I am trying to grow. I am trying to shed my skin, and you also make me temporarily blind. There's a moment here where it just seems flat out wrong, but this is what happens. Finding your gifts and doing the best work of your life is absolutely terrifying. It is also wonderful, but it is not like eating dessert first. Absolutely not. It is hard work. And when I had my show in May, this is exactly what I titled the pop-up show, Far From Shore. This is a photo of my studio. This is when I first got started. Um, this is when there was nobody around to tell me what to do, how to do any of this, which way to go. And for me, I just started approaching every day with beginner's mind. I would try to move through as many canvases as I could. I would work at scales that felt really good, and then at scales that deliberately freaked me out. This is a friend and mentor, Sarah, that we co-painted together. And when the big pieces stopped freaking me out, I'd move to small. Wow, look at that. For those who can't see it in the back, it's across all three screens. So this is pretty, this is quite actually what this, the studio looked like. I started with 36 paintings and it quickly turned into 100. And of all of those 100, I only liked one. So that was the only one that went into the show. But this is my studio. This is a place where there are no rules. There is no case study. 
There are no right answers, and there is absolutely no guaranteed standing at the guaranteed standing ovation at the end of any of this. Um, I think it's this wonderfully safe place where anything is possible, and I'm less sure about everything, and I'm constantly switching it up, and I love it that way. And through all of this process, jumping off the cliff, all these things, we're talking about more metaphorically, I have to say that very realistically, I have entered one of the most creative phases of my life. I really believe that life is so much like a treasure hunt. When you begin to actually believe, and, and think this, when you leave, please think this. As you go back out into the world, think, the whole world is filled with clues just for me, just waiting, like a little treasure hunt, an Easter egg hunt for me to find. And these little clues, they guide me towards my gift. I believe that if you have an internal vision of what you seek, you're much more likely to see it. Let's take the game Solitaire. If you're playing Solitaire and you need the Seven of Spades, when you say that you need the Seven of Spades, I need the Seven of Spades, it will actually become more visible to you. This is how we find that which we seek. And my friends and I, actually just last week, we were talking about this moment in the journey. This, this is the labyrinth, this is the dark night, and it goes on forever. And it's not too dissimilar from waiting for the bus. This is the metaphor that keeps coming up with my friends. Except it's not just any bus, it's your bus. And when it pulls up, and when it pulls away, you know what? It might not be the first bus that arrives. You might still be waiting there on the bench. This is why it's called waiting for the bus. So you'll sit there, and you might actually have to sit and wait a while. You might have to reject the first idea that comes your way. Because you know what? Another bus will come. And when this bus comes, you will get on it. And then, you will promptly get off it. Because you will realize that that too isn't your bus. Because you have come too far. You have done all of this work. Why would you possibly get on the wrong damn bus now? So you're going to sit. And you're going to wait. And this is the best part. When your bus arrives, you will know it. As if you've always known it because you have. The last phase, the fourth and final phase, this is why we do any of this in the first place. This is the great reward. I love the story of the Holy Grail, the quest for the Holy Grail. This is the elixir that gives life to the world. I believe that if you are listening to your own voice, if you are listening to your own calling, and if you're following it, it is the difference between work that shimmers and shines and work that is disposable and cheap. And I believe that when you are committed to this journey, when you are committed to giving your most beautiful, unique, forever and all of time gifts to the world, when the results are not guaranteed, not one bit, I believe it is the worthiest of goals to strive for. Why? Because it benefits so many other people besides just yourself. You get to this place where me and we become inextricably connected. I love this idea that when you serve others and serve yourself, when you're operating from that place, it's the same thing. It is where receiving is giving. And when by putting your gift out into the world, you can actually create ripples through the entire universe. I would like to conclude tonight with a story about a piano. One evening, uh, one of my artist dates was to take myself to the symphony. I wanted to go to the San Francisco Symphony specifically because I just wanted to hear piano. I didn't want to hear the whole symphony. I just wanted to hear the piano. 
And there was this amazing pianist named Andrea Schiff who was playing there. And I bought a ticket, one ticket, because your artist date is by yourself. I got all dressed up. I got on my bike, because that's what I wanted to do, <laughs> in a full-on dress. I biked to the symphony. I chained it up right out front. I had the best parking spot. And I went inside, and I sat down in the fifth row, because that's what we were going to do on my artist date. And I sat down and listened to three hours of the most incredible piano music. I also happened to have the great fortune of sitting next to a man who was enjoying himself as much as I was. And I asked him after the performance what he thought. And he said to me, you know, it's one thing to hear Andreas Schiff play piano on a CD or on the computer. But it's another thing to sit here in the fifth row and to feel the strings vibrating, to watch him never once use a foot pedal, and to see him play the entire French suites from start to finish in three hours from memory with his eyes closed. He spoke with such passion, such drive. I said to him, are you a pianist? Who, me? No, I can't play a tune. But I often have dreams that I can, he said. Thank you. Questions. If you want to. Do you want to take questions? <laughs> I want to hear more artist dates. There you go. Yes. Uh, I might be opening a floodgate, so I apologize. I have a gift for you. So. You have a what? I have a gift for you. A gift? Yes. Wow. I have never thought of writing for reputation or honor. What I have in my heart must come out. That is the reason why. Wow. Thank you. That's beautiful. Any other questions or gifts? <laughs> I'll take the gift. Or artist dates? Yes. Yeah. I love it. She said she wants to make a different flavor of ice cream every day for two months. I'm an ice cream maker. I purchased one from Goodwill, and I can, I can really do this. We need a hashtag if people do Should artist do dates. I love it. Yes, please do it. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, mine's a question. <laughs> Not really an art thing, but so a lot of the things I wrote ended up being random little things that I might, more like a bucket list of things. Mm. Um, but when I think about what I, what my calling is, it ends up feeling more like, oh, I want to help this community, or I want to do something social or whatever. And that doesn't seem like a craving in the sense I would want to take myself on a date to. So how do you come to terms with that? The question was, your, your calling might not be a craving, but you might have tons of cravings. And how do you reconcile that? That is an awesome question. I didn't know that I wanted to paint so much. I had no idea that that was on the other side of those cravings. So I think keep your calling in mind. But what I think is actually much more fruitful is those little urges, those little nudges that like, you are very inexpl ex inexpla unexplainable. And after you go on one of those like, artist dates or do pursue one of those cravings, I think what's really interesting is to say, OK, wait, why did I just go and listen to piano for three hours? What was it about that experience that it's sort of like being malnourished? What was it about that experience that filled me up in some way? And it turned out, for me, there was something about the, the purity and the simplicity of that sound. He didn't even use a foot pedal. It was just the piano. There was something about the minimal use of an instrument and an artist 
th that, that dialogue that I was really craving. And I, so I went back into my studio and I thought, how might I simplify my materials? What if I just, what if I just explored one thing? So I, and then you begin to experiment with it. It's sort of, you're kind of like trying to unlock a puzzle. I guess part of it feels like the cravings seem very self-indulgent, but calling seems like something I'm supposed to help the world with. Hmm. And the, somehow my cravings need to result in something that helps the world rather than just me is what it is. She said that the cravings feel kind of self-indulgent, whereas a calling feels more um, about service. I think that's okay for a little while. Now, if you're still if you're still making ice cream every day, I don't know. Maybe that's like your new thing. I, 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 who am I to judge anyone's artist state? I don't know. I, I think I think it leads you there. I think it leads you there. So be self-indulgent for a little while. It's it's sort of like I once heard this girl say. Um, you know, God, I'm just, I'm just really craving a sable brush to paint with. And, of course, if you go to the store, you could buy, like, an artificial one for, you know, maybe 12 bucks, and a sable brush is, like, 40 bucks. Save up and buy the sable brush. That's totally self-indulgent, but there's a reason. There's a reason. It moves differently across the page, right? So it feels self-indulgent for a while, but give yourself permission. That's a word I love. It should be in here. Permission. So often, it's, you know, we wait for permission from someone, or time off, or it's, you know, oh, how indulgent. I mean, to be honest, when I left my full-time gig and started painting, I felt like a total fraud. I felt like, how privileged am I to be able to paint, right? Like, there are so many other really important things I could be doing, and how, like, I'm just in my studio painting every day. Like, this just felt very self-indulgent. But it led me somewhere, and it, it ultimately didn't feel that way. Yes. How did you learn that your gift could uh, benefit so many people? How did I learn that my gift could benefit so many people? I think all of our gifts can benefit so many people. And whether it's meant to touch 10 people or 10 million, it will connect with those people who are meant to find it. Let's take one more. trying to get friends to go on a hike with me and then like I'm a last minute planner and no one can go and I'm stubborn so I'm like I'm just gonna go anyway, I'll just go by myself. Good. He goes on these extraordinary hikes at night? No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's my artist state, just to go off into the wilderness of Mount Tam. Everything's cooler at night. Yeah. Everything is cooler at night. Thank you so much guys. This has been amazing. I think we have Thank other you. other things planned.